Thank you. I, I'm Shiva Page, uh, also a research associate at ODI. Um, a couple of points. First, Dirk went rather quickly over the 19th century, the analysis of the 19th century having been basically a mercantilist one. I mean, I know pendulums swing all the time, but I didn't think that in international economics we had ever swung back to mercantilism. So let's look again at the 19th century. Why did, probably for North and South America, the um, effects of the Industrial Revolution, if we can still call it that, in Europe were positive, whereas for Asia, we're not quite sure about Africa, they were negative. I mean, this suggests something different about the relationships mm -hmm. to Europe. It, it suggests a lot of things that are different, but it doesn't really come out if you just sort of lump Latin America together as a developing region at the time. It wasn't. It was part of Europe for practical mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. Certainly the uh, Argentina, Chile were, some bits of Mexico. I mean, it was not, mm -hmm. it was much more with integrated at the time. So I think that the question which Dirk also raised of what are countries and what are regions needs to be asked here. I mean, there just isn't a continuity from 1000 to the present for most countries. And there isn't even from 1850 to the present. So I'm, I'm rather concerned about that. A and the other thing is, um, well, uh, let me just leave you with, with that one. Of why, I mean, was there, why did, is it really legitimate to group countries like this over this length of time and why didn't the terms of trade effect happen positively to Asia? Sure, thank you. Could you just pass the mic back to you? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hi, <coughs> I'm Paul Segal. I'm at the International Development Institute at King's College London. Um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, Stephanie mentioned that in the book you uh, report that growth rates in developing countries were already higher than in the industrial countries, 1950 to 1980. So that's very interesting. I didn't know that, but I do think it's important to distinguish between population weighted on the one hand and not population weighted on the other. So um, given that both India and China were growing very slowly in that period, China, I don't know if it was growing at all, India certainly was growing slowly. Um, if you take a population weighted approach, then the developing world is still surely going to be growing more slowly than uh, the rich countries at that point, because you've got a very large share of the developing, developing world population in very low growth countries. Um, Latin America, of course, uh, was, was doing rather well in that period. And my second point then is also related to something Stephanie said about financial, about crises. Um, I've always suspected that, so you know, like you, probably like most people in this room, I uh, have a relatively positive view of ISI. Um, and I've always suspected that if Latin America hadn't had the debt crisis, which I do not believe was caused by ISI, mm -hmm. but was caused by you know, the oil crisis and then the Volcker shock in the US and so on, um, if it hadn't had that crisis, mm -hmm. then I think it would have it wouldn't have had spectacular growth rates in the following 10, 20 years, but it would have continued perfectly reasonably, and you wouldn't have had anything like the lost decade, arguably lost 20 years that Latin America had. So I think that uh, financial crises of the kind that Latin America had have very long-lasting uh, uh, footprints, to mix metaphors. Um, uh, and on that note, our, the, the recent financial crisis that we've had in the rich world seems to me to have been, you know, it's, a, it's been a huge shock to the rich world, and uh, there's talk now of of secular stagnation, it's sort of, mm. um, this idea has come back into fashion, and it looks like we in the rich world might be suffering from very low growth for quite a long time now, partly because of demand issues, maybe also because of technologi technology, uh, technological change possibly slowing down. Um, and so I wonder if that's going to be one of the driving forces to some kind of convergence in the next 10 or 20 years as well. Thanks, Paul. Any more of the side, uh, right, right at the back? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Machiko Nisanke from SOAS. Uh, my question is a bit uh, also related to what has been said. Uh, futuristically, I mean, I'm sure in, in the book, uh, in the book you must have mentioned about the changes in demogra demographic shift. So savings, investment, all these balances are changing. And uh, can we look at the into future, of course, that the demography plays a big role and uh, increases in demand while the aggregate demand for everything will come more from south side, within the south. Mm -hmm. So what do you see, and that is trade side, but then investment side, there are a lot south south uh, investment going on. So what is the role mm -hmm. of south south, so-called cooperation, but it, it is more than just uh, or oh, it's more complicated the story of South South. What is the role of South South in next uh, 
whatever the <laughs> time frame we think. I think the world is changing rapidly. So that is my question. Thank you. Thank you. So Deepak, if you write a book about a thousand years of class of history, you're going to get asked questions about the <laughs> thousand sure. years of class of history. So I think she, you know, Sheila's question is really about the periodization in, in, in the book. And maybe to start with that one, and then you know, to, to take the issues on the, Latin, the financial crisis um, and the South-South trade and demography mm -hmm. story. But maybe I'll leave it to you to decide w which order. Yeah, I'm not sure that in the time available I can address all the questions that have been put to me. Uh, and I will try and, and, and see if I can cluster them uh, to, to, to get a sense. So if you leave the order to me, it might be more efficient in terms of the use of scarce time. Uh, first, there is a cluster of questions about how I expect the future will unfold. And there are variations on, on that same theme. Alas, I did not have time to talk about it in the presentation. Uh, and even the book talks about it uh, in a more encapsulated space. Uh, but let me put it as simply and clearly as I can. Uh, first, economic growth is not about the arithmetic of compound rates. Mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing automatic about growth. Um, and therefore, uh, anyone who believes in a linear extrapolation of mm. this process is only deluding himself or herself or others. You know? uh, in the book, I set out reasons which I believe are good news the reasons why the developing world might be able to sustain this growth. But I also set out factors that are the bad news, why it might not be able to. Some of them are specific to particular countries, the declining productivity of investment in China, or uh, the political system, or the spread of education and society in India, the woeful infrastructure. And some of them are general constraints. You know? Some are endogenous, some are exogenous. You know? uh, but at the end of the day, what I argue, and that is the fundamental argument in the book, that it will be possible for these countries to sustain the process of growth if and only if uh, economic growth, social progress, and human development move in tandem. In other words, if this process is inclusive, mm -hmm. you know, in other words, if the developing world witnesses the kind of Polanyi great transformation mm -hmm. now, huh? Uh, that Europe did in the late 19th, early 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, this is possible. Now, it will not play out in a way that is even remotely equal. Yeah? Uh, what I say is that, that the next 14 are a vanguard. Huh? Uh, one or two might drop out. I don't know how the future will. One or two might come in. Huh? But there's a vanguard. Uh, and then there is another following 10 distributed in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Uh, but what I argue is, is that there are, between the next, among the next 14, there are a large number of differences uh, in size, in economic characteristics, in strategies of development. Uh, and there is something to learn from, from each of them. Uh, and. Uh, Perhaps the small island economies or the landlocked countries don't fit that, mm -hmm. but most other countries would. Mm -hmm. However, it's not about replication. It's mm -hmm. about contextualizing, and it's about learning from their experience. Mm -hmm. um, I actually argue in the book that I think that 50 years, you know, in many ways, Africa at this juncture looks like Asia did 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think there are considerable possibilities in Africa, but they are contingent on what countries do in terms, uh, again, stylized facts, uh, kind of uh, creating initial conditions, um, developing institutions, uh, nurturing supportive governments. Um, now, what I do see that just as the, the end of the, the, the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century was a turning point, you know, the rise of Europe, in particular Britain, and the decline of Asia, uh, 
the beginning of the 20th century was a turning point, uh, which was the rise to dominance of the United States and uh, the beginning of the decline of Britain. Uh, it took 50 years to pay out. Huh? I think this juncture is also a turning point. It's not going to produce a single dominant power. I think it's going to produce a multipolar world. Uh, and those he the, the hegemony is being chipped away at, and those uh, in relative decline are, are reluctant to cede the economic and political space. So it's, a, it's a complex process, but the future will play out in a way uh, that economic and political power are distributed rather differently in 2050 from what it was in 1950, significantly differently. Uh, the second cluster of questions was about the state. Uh, and, you know, Stephanie said state intervention, yes, but it has to be good intervention. Uh, Dirk wants to know where I stand in his <laughs> panorama of, 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 of <laughs> of, of photographs. Um, now, I want to say the following, that, you know, there, there is no magic wand huh, that can, uh, well, let me begin with two propositions. I believe that, this, you know, we have moved from a world in which most people believe that the state could do nothing wrong to a world in which most people believe that the state could do nothing right. Mm. Uh, but these are caricatures of perceptions. Uh, two propositions. First, the state and the market, both institutions evolved by humankind to organize society, uh, are complements, not substitutes. Uh, and it's therefore it's not either or. Uh, and second, that the role of the state vis-a-vis -vis the market must change as time and circumstances change. Mm -hmm. Now, success in a sense a development has been about those who, who recognize the complementarity between the state and the market, uh, and who recognize that there has to be an adaptive interaction between the two institutions. Now, you can put it in Polanyi's double movement, but, but, but it, it, it's a more general argument. And therefore, I would be reluctant to, to say to you, Dirk, where I, where I stand. Uh, in the middle. Uh, well, no, it depends. By the way, there are countries that succeeded which relied much yes. more on markets and openness. Yes, exactly. uh, uh, their object was to, to minimize uh, government failure, if you like. Mm -hmm. And there were others who were much more in, 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 in intervention That's and true. calibrated openness. In the book, you'll find a detailed discussion of mm. this. So even the next 14 are not black and white. They're shades of gray. Uh, they had very different kind of mixes of, mm. of, 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 of models of, of state and market. Uh, so that you cannot, but a nurturing, supportive role for the state was important everywhere. Mm. That role varied. It was not the same. Mm. So I think one has to be much more uh, open about this. It has to do with history. It has to do with context. It has to do with political leaderships, what path they take. It has to do with size. Uh, but it is possible to succeed. You know, I even argue that you know both democracy and integrity are desirable. But many of the next fourteen uh, were neither democratic, and they were very corrupt regimes. And yet they were able to do some things. It was about control mechanisms. I do discuss this in the book. If there were time, I would discuss it more here. Uh, uh, but control mechanisms essentially come from institutions. Uh, that create checks and balances. Now, the ultimate control mechanism, in my view, in a long-term perspective, is that the state and the market themselves are institutions mm -hmm. that exercise checks and balances with each other. They are control mechanisms. So if you have a, a state that becomes larger in the li life, there are no control mechanisms. Or a market that becomes larger in life, mm -hmm. there are no control mechanisms. Uh, but that's you know at the top level in the hierarchy, but at every level there have to be control mechanisms. Uh, and that's really what I want to, to, to say about the state. Now, there were a number of questions. Yes, the book is relatively silent on finance, mm. Mm, except when I talk about the financial crisis and what it might mean for the future, or what it meant for Latin America mm. uh, and Eastern Europe, the lost decades, mm. as it were. Exactly. Um, 
if it were a larger book or a longer book, it would have addressed that question. Um, terms of trade, yes, uh, I could have, but I do not discuss it, again, for want of space. Mm. Uh, uh, terms of trade played a role, huh? uh, but the great specialization huh, was not about the terms of trade alone. It locked countries into an international division mm. of labor, mm. even Latin America, hmm? uh, which was, as you said, uh, Sheila, Latin America was at that time uh, more developed than some parts of Southern Europe. Huh? And indeed, if you look at 1870 to, to 1950, Latin America, I say, is a success story. Uh -huh. right. uh, and it had to do with, with, with states, it had to do with import substitution, mm. it had to do with with, 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 with policies. Um, now, third, uh, there is a set of questions about industrialization and, and deindustrialization. Now, if, you know, I haven't expressed myself clearly if you draw the conclusion that it's a mercantilist view. Far from it. This was the logic in the outcome of capitalist development. Huh? That you know the same process that led to the industrialization of Europe led to the deindustrialization of Asia, mm -hmm. and the great divergence and the great specialization were in that sense closely related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, this was not mercantilism, if you like. If you look at the rise of Europe in the period 1500 to 1800, uh, mercantilism plays a role. That mix of state and naval power, voyages of discovery. Uh, the colonization of the Americas. The first phase of colonialism is about a mercantilism. This phase is not. This, is, this phase is about the, the, the development of capitalism in the world economy. And it produces two sides of the same coin in, 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 in terms of, of uh, outcomes. And I would still argue, I would urge you to look at the book uh, a second time around, I would still argue that there was cause and effect. Huh? If you look at the period from 1870 to 1950 in particular, uh, uh, between the industrialization that happened in Europe and the deindustrialization that happened in Asia, uh, mm. and why even Latin America, which had manufacturing capacities, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, actually got locked into that division of labor uh, where it produced only primary commodities. It was as much part of the great specialization. Mm. So if you look at Finland or we spend a lot of time looking at this. Uh, so does Jose Antonio Campos' book on, on the economic history of, of Latin America since independence, mm. how Latin America got, got locked into this uh, division mm. of labor. Um, Sheila's question about, China. you know, Temporal divides and geographical divides. Uh, in the sense, my book does depart. You know, th there are no historians here, but many of them would quarrel with me. Mm. Uh, I actually look at, uh, and you know, I discuss this in chapter three of the book, why I choose this periodization, okay? Um, and many would agree with me. People like Ron Finlay and Kevin O'Rourke would agree with me. Uh, but my periodization essentially is 1500 to 1800, okay? And you don't have to worry about data, Dirk. There's now enough evidence to tell us that demography, technology, and institutions in Europe and Asia were roughly comparable circa 1970. I've looked at the evidence on, on income estimates, you know, everybody, Madison, Kuznets, uh, Landis, lots of people have looked at it. But if you cross-check different sources, not just Madison, you look at Paul Byrock's work, you, you, you find that what one is saying about it shares is, is, is roughly correct. They're orders of magnitude. They're not, you know, it's not 50% may mean 45% or it may mean 56%, but it, it is there. Now, the fact that India and China had half the world's population and half the world's income doesn't mean they were rich countries because then per capita income was roughly similar. So income was distributed in exactly the same way as population was in the world. Uh, the only thing is that, that Western Europe and North America pull away, and China and India, that were the manufacturing economies of the world. Please remember that the Europeans were searching for silver because they wanted to pay for the textiles and the silks and the porcelain they got from India and China. Uh, and they ran huge trade, trade, trade deficits. 
but to go back to the question, my periodization is 1500, 1800, 1820, 1950, uh, and 1950, 2010. Okay? The period between 1000 and 1500, I don't spend very much time on, except in explaining why, how, how it became the foundation of what happened uh, with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, uh, but Finlay and O'Rourke do that. They, they, they look at it. Um, so this is a periodization I would stand by. And I think if you're doing a big picture book, yes, I recognize it, there are differences within Latin America, within Africa, and within Asia. Uh, uh, but I think that it is possible if you're looking at a sufficiently long period mm. of time to treat them as regions mm. without in any way failing to recognizing to recognize the diversity within the region and it is possible to generalize uh, uh, about Asia about Africa and about Latin America uh, within limits uh, but you could you could actually try and do it you know for 20 countries in each region uh, and it would become impossible in terms in analytical terms to do I must stop Thank you. What, what I'd like to do is, is uh, if we can, to try and squeeze in another brief round of questions. Uh, and, I, and I would ask people to make them brief. But let's uh, start on this side of the room. Please. There were two or three Sorry. I should have answered. Yeah. I didn't. Okay. I'll is it working? Uh, Diana Hunt, formerly Sussex University. I do remember Diana. <laughs> um, Two questions, Deepak. Um, first of all, I, very, I haven't read your book and I look forward to doing so. I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, the primary sector has had virtually no mention today, just mm. for the first time by yourself, briefly just now, almost as if it was an embarrassment, something that one doesn't <laughs> want to talk about. No, no it's not an embarrassment. Good. No, no. Um, because clearly at certain points of time it has played a key role in, in some regions in their development and continues to do so today. Uh, so I was just wondering what your, very briefly, what your rule, view is on the roles that the primary sector has played in the development process. Mm. Uh, secondly, I, you have said several times that institutions are key, are very important. And you have also said, um, uh, uh, at least twice, that in the period 1500 to 1800, in your view, institutions in different parts of the world were very comparable. I Europe and Asia. Ah, okay. 1750. Well, we we stick to different. Europe and Asia. All right, we stick to Europe and Asia. Uh, what are these key institutions which, during those three centuries, were comparable? There, yeah, okay. Okay, one, one, one second. Oh. Um, so you, you, you were going to ask a second question, Sid. If you, want, if you still have a second question, uh, please. That um, thank you. It was really about the, uh, the wars question which uh, Stephanie raised, but uh, in a different sense, that from a political point of view, the interests that different regions have had in each other have been very different in these different periods. And mm. uh, I think that this must have something to do with mm. the amount of economic emulation that was happening among them at different periods. And at least in your presentation, it was a purely economic one. There was no mention of the fact that you're talking about, in a sense, empires in China and Brazil at least, which had relations with Europe of very different sorts. And these are things which, to a historian, I think, would have quite a lot to do with what happened to their institutions and therefore to what happened to their economies. Thank you. So another um, couple of very big Broad questions. Um, maybe given there are only two, I'm going to th throw throw in one as well, if I may, or just a, s a supplementary. That you know that I th I think the question on primary commodities actually goes to mm -hmm. something at the heart of your book, which y you start to develop but don't develop. And I'd like to get your take on that. You know, if you because if you look at Africa's standing in your broader story, you know the share of value added in international, you know, despite the high growth of the last decade the share of value added in international trade hasn't, I mean, the needle hasn't really shifted, you know, principally because it's driven by, you know, extractive-led growth. And, and, I, and I just wonder, you know, if you have a broad sense on what some of the conditions 
might be for you know coming out of that sort of trajectory and moving into higher value added areas of, of production. And the, 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 and the, the last supplementary I wanted to ask was, you know, the, the, the period you describe in, in great detail is one in which you've got demography, technology, institutions, and rules of the game that are defined first by mercantilism and then by colonialism, you know, in the way that different countries were integrated into that system clearly shaped mm. the options that were available. Um, you know, we don't have that system anymore, but we, you know, we do have sets of rules in you know, the international trading regime. You know, we have rules and norms in international mm -hmm. finance. And some people argue, I mean, Danny Roderick would, for example, that, you know, that these are, for many countries, a potential constraint yeah. on the type of policies that you, know, you, would add, you would see as being associated with this convergence process. So I'd just be interested to know Can what... Can I just what, add something? Please, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, to your first question, Kevin, I was wondering if I could add, also I think there's a big concern in Latin America about how uh, countries like Chile, for example, are actually increasing dramatically the share of their primary exports, basically to China or to Asia mm. in general. So people say, you know, are we deindustrializing? And, and, and so therefore there is, are they going back to this old pattern uh, where primary exports are playing such a big role, what does that mean for development? And of course, even more dramatically for, for, for mm. Africa, as, as you pointed out. So because I've chaired the meeting so hopelessly, we have actually <laughs> <laughs> uh, overrun time. But Deepak, maybe okay. if you could try and respond to it, and, uh, and then I'd like to give both Stephanie yeah. and, and uh, uh, one line is I think, remark. yes, the gentleman over there asked about the longer term consequences of the financial crisis mm. for economic growth in the industrialized world. I do talk about it in the book. Uh, and while it will constrain growth in the developing world too, because I think this decoupling mm, exactly. hypothesis is nonsense, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, it's just arithmetic. If, if uh, Western Europe grows at less than 1% per annum, its share in world GDP is bound to decline. And catch up in that sense mm. will gather momentum. Yes, and I actually say that. But that, I don't think, is the kind of catch-up we mm -hmm. are looking for. Uh, it, it, it is much more substantive about being inclusive because it's about the demand side as much. That's what creates virtuous circles of cumulative causation. I think what the lady said over there is critical. That in many ways it is, you know, Many years ago in a paper I wrote, I described the North-South dialogue as a dialogue of the deaf and South-South cooperation as a search of the blind. <laughs> they were not going anywhere. But now the, the economic logic and compulsions of South engagement uh, of countries with each other in the South is very strong. Mm -hmm. And you know, just look at their share of world GDP just look at their share of world manufacturing value added, look at their share of world trade, huh? whatever you look at. So th their growth process is going to rely much more on themselves. Mm. And that is actually why the, some developing countries like China, India, and Brazil did better uh, in the aftermath mm. of the global financial mm. crisis. Uh, they were, the impact was much less, their recovery was much faster. And that's because there were sources of demand elsewhere, particularly within these economies, but also in the South. Uh, Diana, my silence in the presentation did not mean that I'm not concerned with the primary sector. In fact, if you read the book, you will see it's critical to the argument about the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Uh, it's critical to the argument about why China and India were what they were. Huh? They had very sophisticated agricultures. Huh? Um, and uh, so, in a sense, the primary sector of economies is talked about throughout the book, but it's not center stage as industrialization is, okay? And I do look at the importance of structural change in the composition of output in employment, but in a rather different way. You know, the, not just the Clark Kuznets view of, of, of economic uh, growth, being a source of structural change. I believe in the heterodox mode that structural change drives economic mm. growth too. Huh? So the primary sector in that sense is critical and, and there are there is extensive discussion of it in the big picture. 
But there's also discussion of it in, in the next 14, because countries were very different. There were those that were uh, resource poor and land scarce. Mm -hmm. huh? They relied on cheap labor. There were those that were resource rich and land abundant. They relied on natural resources and primary commodities mm -hmm. to lead their process of growth. Huh? So there was a, a diversity in the process. Institutions, by the way, if you look at the book, uh, and this is not new, there are a large number of people. Uh, Kenneth Pomeranz, for example, makes a detailed comparison of Western Europe and China in terms of life expectancy, birth rates, death mm -hmm. rates. Uh, there, there is other work by, done by historians which makes comparisons in terms of institutional structures in commerce, in trade, banking, uh, you know, apprenticeships in manufacturing activities, a whole lot of institutions were, were, were roughly at par. I could list them for you. Not all, but many important ones are actually listed in the book. Kevin, your last question. I do mention it towards like the it. end, but you know it's been the focus of my other work. Huh? Mm. It's just that this book had to be finite, and it was getting out of hand. Clearly, clearly the, the ability of developing countries to continue this pace of industrialization mm -hmm. and for others to follow in their footsteps will depend on how much uh, rules of the game in the world economy uh, constrain or do not constrain their policy space. Uh, because uh, success stories mm -hmm. have in, by and large been about clever forms of intervention. Mm -hmm. Uh, they may have relied more on markets and openness. They may have relied more on, on state intervention and, and sort of calibrated openness. But in the book, I make a distinction between countries that rely on, on foreign capital, foreign markets, foreign technology. Uh, and there are some that rely only on, on uh, external markets, but domestic resources, domestic technology. If, every country in that sense mm. has pursued a different path. And uh, that is why I think there are uh, role models for different countries of different sizes in different locations mm -hmm. to have. And I am not the pessimist. I think it is possible even for small countries. Who would have given, you know, B Bomol in his work uh, picks up Japan, but in 1870, who would have picked up Japan? Mm -hmm. In 1960, would anyone have thought of Taiwan or Singapore? Huh? They were small countries. Uh, so I think it's perfectly possible. Huh? Uh, but it doesn't mean it's likely. It will depend on, on, on political, economic, and social okay. conjunctures. And Sheila, lastly, may I say that in many ways, colonialism, political power, is part of the argument in the book. It's just that there is only so much I could say in 20, 25 minutes. Uh, uh, how the world economy was carved up was, was the part of that political process. Mm -hmm. But it was a juxtaposition of economics and politics. Uh, you had the Industrial Revolution, you had I imperialism in the second phase, and you had a communication and transport revolution that collapsed geographical distance in time. So that no amount of protection for China and Indian manufacturers would have been good enough. But when it was superimposed by, by free trade imposed by European countries on them, that was the end of their industry. Deepak, thank you. Um, Stephanie and, and then Dirk, maybe if you could, uh, two or three minutes. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I very much like uh, uh, Deepak's last remarks in two particular aspects, both, I think, very Asian and very bricky. First, <laughs> um, I love the way you put the stuff about checks and balances uh, between the market and the state as a complement, not as a substitute, as a pragmatic thing, not as an ideology. And one of the things that I've noticed is that in countries, where people talk like that, they seem to do well. If you go to Germany, the right and the left don't have such a different discourse on how you do um, energy policy, how you implement renewables. The, the, the state, the development bank, works with the private banks. The governments work with the private sector. And, and, and there is this interaction which is not, I think it's become over-ideologized, particularly actually from the right. I think the right has set up this thing that markets versus states. And, and it's, it's, um, it's this kind of Asian-like approach, but also German, Brazilian, and so on, where, where you combine both in the most creative way. 
rather than keep fighting little battles like we sometimes do in the Anglo-Saxon world. I, so I think that's very positive. And the other thing where you, I think being very BRICS uh, and, and very refreshing in a European context is, is your optimism. Because in Europe, we're always think, we're scared about the lack of growth, about the next crisis. Whereas in when, when one goes to Brazil or one goes to India or China, okay, there are problems, but basically we're going ahead. We're surging ahead. And I have been living a lot in Europe. Uh, I have some fears because I have fear, for example, of, uh, as, a, as was already mentioned also by Paul, um, I, I think finance is a bit out of hand. Yep. It's out of hand in the Euro in Europe and in the United States. They, we haven't really sorted out financial regulation, and 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 the bad may be driving out the good in countries like India and China and so on. And so there is a risk that that that, that this uh, bad financialization could actually undermine undermine these good I things. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And also, I think um, there is another risk related but a little bit separate, is that the slowdown in the developed countries, um, particularly Europe, but Europe, but the US is not doing that great either, um, could uh, become, a, as you hinted, uh, could become a barrier for the dynamism of, of, of the developing world. Because, because um, you know, part of the story, of course, after the Second World War and so on, for, for the rise, this catch up and the rise of the South was, was quite a dynamic North. And if we have, you know, a number of people begin to talk about it, we could have very, very weak growth for a very long time worldwide, and particularly in trade. And that's my final point. If world trade, as, as our friend Jose Antonio has been stressing, is really slowing down, what does that mean for development strategies? Does it mean a much more emphasis on South-South, on regional integration, to a certain extent in the big countries on import substitution? Um, because w w was all this export-led growth, which was great, but based on this very great dynamism of, of world trade. Thanks very much, Stephanie. So, Dirk, this is your opportunity to challenge the response to your pendulum. <laughs> but um, also, there's. But a I guess you could place me near Arjun Chan. <laughs> you want to put me somewhere? Yes. <laughs> no, no. You okay, denied let's, being let's, part of the panorama. Let's hold the Hall of Fame. Yeah. But I think that may be the wrong way of seeing this this debate. Okay. Well, I, I give Dirk a, an opportunity to, to respond to that. But Dirk, there's also a question from Carolina Arego, who's a PhD candidate, one of the on, online audience. I'm looking at Paul because you, she's uh, from King's also asking a question about the extent to which um, um, aid for trade provisions can might help facilitate the type of catch-up that um, Deepak described, and I guess for some of the countries that figured on your chart, you know, the small countries, small island states. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, the, well thank you for, uh, indeed. Um, um, I think that um, uh, first of all, on the, on the pendulum, I think uh, I'm very much on your on your line. I think the uh, sort of state and business need to work together, complementary, um, and that could be pro uh, that could provide a check and a check and balance. But I don't think we're there yet. Uh, there are still lots of research questions out there. I think in terms of what does it look like, and could you incentivize this? Could you? Uh, from an outside point of view, say, well, we didn't have checks and balances now in this particular country, this context, mm -hmm. and then five years later we have it. Uh, so, because if you had that, if you could do that, you could turn a country around in your, in, in your view. And if you, so I think that's that's still an, an, an important uh, research question. And um, and and by the way, there are lots of research programs out there, including the Diffid ESRC Growth Research Program, that ask those uh, um, those questions and where you can. Uh, can apply for, <laughs> for indeed, uh, and I think it's that's still an important question we need to be uh, to be thinking about. But I, I'm on your line, uh, uh, Deepak, and I'll uh, I'll put you in between uh, uh, Arjun and uh, and Justin. Okay. Uh, great. Um, uh, on the on the sector point, I think that also what I really liked in your book as well was the services uh, uh, dimension that you highlighted, which I think is really important as well. That that for the future, it's not just uh, agriculture, it's not mm. just manufacturing, it's all sectors. All sectors can work mm -hmm. together, and it needs to be balanced approach to uh, towards sectors. And it's and it's the, in, in the past services weren't that traded, as you said, and uh, now they're more traded. And new technological developments also might, might bring opportunities. And also on the positive note, I think uh, uh, on your your uh, you talked about inequality, wealth inequality. Um, you've got data up to 2000. Mm. Well, Branko Milanovic has just done a paper 
and uh, very cautiously, but he, he uh, that all the data now points is going to point downwards. It's uh, it's all in terms of uh, world inequality, and, uh, um, and uh, 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 so so that's that's pro some positive news uh, from mm -hmm. those who are concerned with world world inequality. It, it, le it looks as if. Uh, but Gabriel Palmer shows yeah. quite. Uh, I mean, well, his his evidence is to two thousand eight, but. Okay, yeah. I'd look forward to <laughs> We have that, 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 <laughs> that, 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 that <laughs> We probably shouldn't open yeah. up a whole new avenue of dialogue yeah. at this point. On, on, on aid for trade, um, I think that it also um, depends on in what circumstances it um, uh, uh, is being provided, but it could indeed provide a stimulus to, uh, to economies. Uh, uh, and it can help to uh, reduce the cost of trading, which can be important in certain, uh, in, uh, in, in many many instances. And uh, if this is put in place uh, with complementary policies uh, to enhance the productive cap capabilities, it could work. Uh, it could work really well, and it could indeed help uh, countries to um, uh, to um, to uh, uh, promote trade uh, and growth and productivity. Uh, so I think it is an, it is a valuable instrument. And and by the way, we've just done a book on that. Which we uh, which we've launched as well uh, a couple of couple of um, of, uh, of months ago. Th this doesn't take away from the excellent book, Deepak, that you you've done, and I uh, and I re really really enjoyed it, and uh, and really stre uh, was stretching my mind in terms of the, the long term perspective. Mm. So thank you very much indeed for the excellent book. Thank you, and, and well, ju just to conclude very brief, if I may, the um, I, I I do think that. I, I'm not going to get drawn into it. Uh, Dirk and I have this um, uh, ongoing argument, which I'm not going to get drawn into, despite, Com his, best, debate. despite his best efforts. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think what Branco's, you know, th there's, there's basically two different things that are going on yeah, with inequality okay. data, which is that if you look at the global number, you know, it, it's pretty much flat. But what that masks is the fact that within country, mm. inequalities are tending upwards. Now, you know, Branco's argument is that the data within country doesn't capture the wealth of the very rich, yep. and that if you were to capture that wealth, you know the story would look somewhat different. But given that Branco is actually mm -hmm. coming to do what you've done today next week and present this uh, okay. new paper, um, we'll continue the, the discussion. <laughs> well, I will double in, in, in the room. For trade, but <laughs> but the, the 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 main thing I want to say, actually, that, you know, I I really think this is a tremendous service that you've done, deep, Deepak, for, for the whole debate on globalisation and, and development. And for me, you know, the, the thing it really underlines is just how important it is to try and understand the history mm. behind the economics of, mm. of these processes. Because, you know, we do live in a period of pretty dramatic change. And it often seems to me that we're, we're doing institutional catch-up. You know, the, the world, you know, the, the, the tectonic plate shift on the economy and end up out of alignment with a multilateral system, which makes it increasingly difficult to negotiate agreements on some of the huge mm -hmm. challenges that we face in climate, on trade, on, on, on finance. So I think this does a great service in, in terms of understanding that. And uh, I'm sure all of you will join me in, in thanking Deepak for being here and, and our <laughs> speakers. <laughs>